Um, sorry for cutting the worship uh, <coughs> the worship service short. Uh, it's kind of felt like as we were worshiping that uh, it was uh, it was time to press on. So I did. Um, y- you know, in in in, in um, I think I want to say it's in First Kings. Um, you're gonna want that on, buddy. I gave Benny a PowerPoint, and he's over there trying to turn off the uh, projector. I'm like, a bad timing, brother. Um, but in uh, in the ki- in the books of the kings in, in the Old Testament, it talks repeatedly that, um, you know, this king did this and this, and then it says, um, but he failed to uh, get rid of all the um, idols. Basically, it's they were called Ashtoreth poles and bells, but basically idols. Um, and you know, it just it just got me thinking. You know, um, in the past. Um, us, us in this church have gotten a little bit sidetracked about some stuff. Um, you know, we're, 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 be, we're being brought out of that, you know. The Holy Spirit is leading us in a new direction. The pastor is leading us in a new direction. But before, you know, we got kind of sidetracked on some things. And while we were getting sidetracked, there were, there were idols coming in. You guys know the story, uh, 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 the story of Gideon? He's, he's, he's out, you know, try basically getting a, getting a harvest to hide, you know, because let's just say some bad guys are taking it away. And uh, and God says, you know, I'm going to use you, whatever. Um, and uh, it says that that he went, he goes home, and, and he and he waits till the cover of night because he's so scared. And he and he goes out and he te- tears down this um, basically this idol during the cover of night while he, because he's so scared. And you know, basically what's happened um, in 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 this city and in in, in this area is we've allowed the enemy to come in and build up towers and to build up build up idols. And so what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to go back and tear down the and tear down the strongholds. And the thing is is they're not they're not physical strongholds, they're spiritual strongholds that are within the people uh of this town and of the uh, and of the surrounding area. And so it's not going to be something that we can go in guns a blazing about. It's going to be something that we're going to have to witness to people slowly and day by day with the continual witness. You know, in the book of Acts, um, the Holy Spirit moved in such a way where pretty much they went in, they ministered, people were saved and they left. You know what I mean? They, they set up things. Like I think Paul was in Corinth, I think, for three years establishing the church, and they moved on somewhere else. You know what I mean? Um, but that's not really how it's going to work for us so much because the church is already established. But what we need to do now is we need to be, be praying. We need to be going out and working day by day the field because we don't want to lose any of the harvest. And so what we're talking about tonight is the Trinity witnessing to those who think they are saved. Um, oftentimes, it can be extremely tricky um, to witness to people when they feel like they are saved. Um, well, let me give you an example of this. Uh, the, the, the Baptist church across the street, did you know that they're saved too? They're Christians too? We, have, we, we, we may disagree about a few things, but I mean, we're, we still believe in the same God. The Catholic Church over there, they, they believe in the same God that we do. In fact, if you go and read uh, the Catholic statements, they'll, they'll talk about the triune God, the Trinity. Um, uh, the, the people who, who, who are not Christian, would we, we could say, we're, first off, we could say people like, you know, uh, is, uh, Muslims. Uh, y- we could say that they're not Christian because they serve uh, Allah and we serve Yahweh. So two different gods. And if you look at their character, we can see a difference. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't serve the same God as we do. Uh, Mormons don't serve the same God as we do. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Witnessing to those who think they are saved. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, buddy. Let me actually move this out of the way here. You're not going to go, buddy? You're getting pushy. You, you, uh, you, you, ha- you have to learn to, w- to read uh, Benny. When he starts doing the that means he's getting awful twitchy. It's probably frozen back there. I broke it. I have broken the computer. Uh, do you want me to... Is it coming back on? or? Okay. All right, there we go. So who is God. Let's talk about why our God is different than, than the Muslim's God, the Jehovah's Witness God. Uh, if, if you will, turn to Exodus 3.13. 
So after God, after God created the world and everything, you know, man sinned against God, and as a result, they fell from, they fell from the Garden of Eden. And uh, throughout the course of time, they just kind of started forgetting who God was. And so, when, so later, God decided to use a man by the name of Moses, and he had to reveal himself uh, in such a way because he wasn't, people didn't, uh, to put it in an Old Testament vernacular, uh, people lived however they saw fit. So if you look in Exodus three thirteen through fourteen, God is, God is telling him, you know what his name is. What his name is. Uh, it picks up. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel, which is the people who Mo- who God called Moses to uh, to lead, um, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, and that that right there is is it's a little bit tricky to translate, but basically it's Yahweh. That that's 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 the word there, uh, and and it's a little bit tricky to to um to translate. It seems like it's the verb to be. Basically, I am. That's the if you know anything about English, that's that's the that's the verb to be. Okay, um, and uh, and and so your your translations might translate a little bit differently. I am who I am. I am who I will be, or I will be who I am, or you'll say something along those lines. Basically, um. The idea behind it is that God, God is, he is alive, okay, he is, he exists, always has and always will, he is, but then also um, it, it carries the, kind of the connotation of um, God is by the things that he does. You know, we can call God healer because that is who he is. We can call him love because that is who he is. That is his character. Does that make sense? So uh, it kind of carries that kind of idea to, to it. So uh, we see in the Bible a trinity, that it, and all that Trinity means, let me break this down because, you know, this is kind of one of those churchy words that we don't really hear anywhere else. It basically just means tri-unity, three-oneness, okay? Um, so God is three persons. If we look in, and you don't have to turn with me to all these different places. I, I don't want you to wear out your fingers. <laughs> uh, but in Genesis 1.26, it says, uh, then God said, let us make man in our image. The, the words there are the plural in the, plural in the Hebrew. Uh, and then also in Psalm 110.1, one, um, which is actually one of the verses that are used in the book of um, Hebrews to establish that point. Come on. One ten one. The Lord said to my Lord, "Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool." See, the Lord said to my Lord, establishing that there are two things there. So, um, second, e- so God is three persons. There's three distinctions. Okay, the the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. And uh, then each person is fully God. Uh, I'll turn over to John one here. So the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is also fully God. John 1 says it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So we see that each person is fully God. Um, and I, I want to clear something up here. Uh, if you t- have to spend some time talking with Jehovah's Witness, they'll say that this should be translated as, uh, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. And the reason why they say that is, uh, I'll try not to go too, too in-depth with this, but just enough to kind of give you an idea. Um, in the Greek, there's only, there's, no, um, there's only one article. It's the definite article. And it is absent from this word here, God. It's, it, it, it's, it's not ha the os. It's just the os, which is God. So they say, since it does not say the God, I mean, specifically the God, singular, that, that, that it should be um, translated as a God instead in Genesis, uh, John 1. And the reason why it is not translated that, like that is because in Greek, if, the predic- if it is the predicate and not the subject of the sentence, it will not carry the definite article. See, anybody who's passed their first year of Greek will know this, and we'll get into this later. The Jehovah's Witness have retranslated the Bible based off of misunderstandings in the Greek text, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, 1 John 2, 1. In fact, can I get some help on this? Can I have Chuck, can, do you have your Bible access? Yeah. Can you turn to Matt twenty eight nineteen? I don't want to spend the whole night flipping myself here. Uh, and uh, Serena, did you have a Bible there with you? Can you turn to Acts 5, 3 through 4? 
So I'll turn to 1 John. And this is what it says in 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. See what I said? There's a, there's a distinction there, isn't there? He says we have an advocate for the, advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ. If they were the same, it, it, see what I mean? So we see that each person is fully God and that only God can do that. Uh, but we also see that God is three persons in the fact that Jesus is clearly shown as not the Father. Um, and Matt, Matt 28, 19, who had that? You? Go ahead. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, the name there is singular. In the name of the Father, not in the names, but in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see the distinction, but we also see the separation. Uh, you want to read Acts 5, 3 through 4? Okay, now what did he say there? Who did he lie to? God, but what did he say before that? You have lied to the Holy Spirit. Establishing there, he, he, he's, saying, he's referring to the Holy Spirit as, a, as an actual being, and the, whole, and the Jehovah's Witness will tell you that the Holy Spirit is just the power of God. We see that that's not right. See, it was not by, it, it, he didn't lie to God's power. That wouldn't make any sense. He lied to God, who was the Holy Spirit. See, so there are, uh, three persons, and each person is fully God. But we also see that there is only one God. Obviously, we could turn to Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But I wanted to read this one instead. Isaiah 45 says this in uh, verses 5 through 6. Uh, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Are you, are you kind of getting his message here? There is no other. <laughs> and if you look at there in the Hebrew, you'll find that this is also in the singular. I am the Lord. Not the Lord's, not God's. I am the Lord. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, there, there, there are basically two different misunderstandings with the Trinity that have historically come up. One is that they, they try to overestablish the distinctions, you know, that, that the Father is a God, and then the Holy Spirit is a God, and then Jesus is a God. And then another one is that they'll go to the other extreme and say that there is only one God, and, 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 and he just basically changes forms uh, for different occasions. Um, this, I think it was called Sabellianism back in the day, but now it's, now it's resurfaced as Jesus only. Um, and basically what they teach is that God appears in different forms. So in the Old Testament, he appeared as a father because he needed to. And in the New Testament, he appeared as the son because he needed to. So he basically changes forms to accommodate. So there's, there's, no, there's no distinctions there between the persons. There is just one, the one person. Uh, so therefore, it's not a triune being. It is a singular being. Um, so basically, this d denies the distinction of the Godhead that we see throughout Scripture. And in, in essence, they worship a different God. I could get into it, but I don't really want to. It's kind of a waste of time. Go to the next slide. Uh, and then Jehovah's Witnesses are the ones who are on the other side of that. They will say that um, the Holy Spirit is God's power. Okay, And if we look at Luke 4, 14, uh, and uh, Chuck, do you want to take John 1, 1 through 4? Uh, Luke, one, Luke 4, 14. Uh, 4.14 says this. You know, it's important to know what we believe. It's important. In 1 Timothy, he, write, he writes about not being persuaded to other, to other false doctrines. How are you not persuaded to other false doctrines if you don't know your own doctrine? See what I mean? So I'm going to start out with a little bit of doctrine. I know this is a little, maybe a little bit boring to some. Uh, then we're going to finish up with, with, with witnessing tacti tactics uh, for the cults. And so just give me a second here. So the Holy Spirit is God's power. If we look at Luke 4.14, it says this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, if the Holy Spirit is God's power, this would mean, 
okay? And Jesus returned in the power of the power in Galilee. Wait, what? That just doesn't make sense. Uh, on a grammatical scale, that just doesn't make sense. See, see what I'm saying there? If, if the Holy Spirit is just God's power and not part of the Trinity, then how do we reconcile verses like this where there's clearly a distinction? Uh, go ahead and read John 1, 1 through 4. Okay, so that's what I just read a second ago. And, and if you were listening to it this time, it said very specific, okay, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, uh, with God, and the Word was God. Okay, but then in the next part it says, um, I, I have this memorized, it's just I'm drawing a blank. What's verse 2? Um, yeah, uh, and, and then after that it, it, ta- it, it says that, it says, ver- it says uh, how does it word it? I'm sorry I'm drawing a blank, you guys. I, 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 I did memorize these passages. I just can't recall the memory when I'm in front of people. Uh, can you read verses 3? Right there. Yes. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That's pretty simple. The Jehovah's Witness will teach that Jesus was created, that he is not really fully God, that he was the first created thing from God, and then he created all other things. But we see in John 1... Uh, 1, 1 through 4, that that's not the case. What we see is that it says very specifically that all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So how could Jesus have come into being if he needed himself to come into being? That's a paradox, and it just doesn't make sense. See what I'm saying? So you, have to, you have to clearly ignore what the scriptures te- teaches us to embrace ideas like this. Um, they deny the full deity of Jesus, obviously, since they make him a created being. I want to also point out that only God is worthy of, of worship and, and praise, and we see Jesus being worshipped and glorified in the in, in New, in New Testament. So why, why would God, who is, by the way, a very jealous God, allow um, for a created being to be worshipped, no matter how godly they were? See, I mean, he doesn't allow for that, um, because he is a very jealous God, um, which is, you know. Uh, so denies power and person of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, I don't need to explain why that's bad. Uh, worship's a different God than we do. Basically, that, that's basically it. They, they, they call him Jehovah, and, and they, try to, they try to say that he's Yahweh, but he's actually a completely different God. Um, uh, denies every major doctrine of the Bible. Jehovah's Witness retranslate the Bible okay, to, the, to a different text, which, by the way, no serious Greek scholar supports. Okay? And, then th- and then they disagree with every major doctrine of the Bible, every single one. Here's a little newsflash. If you don't know an if you don't know an an, 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 an an ancient language, you shouldn't translate it and tell people that this is the only way. If you don't even understand it, okay? You see, I'm you see, what I'm saying there. If you can't even translate it, you have no right to deny every major doctrine, okay? And that's exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses do. Go to the next slide. Uh, so, so, so some, va- some facts about Jehovah's Witness. We're going to look a lot, a lot about Charles Russell, Russell because Scripture says. Uh, scripture says that you will know them by their fruit. And so we're going to look at this. It was founded by a man named Char- Charles T. Russell, and uh, his successor was, na- was a man by the name of Judge Rutherford. Um, they use, I just said this, they use a translation of the Bible. They translated themselves, which no serious, bi- uh, serious Greek scholars support. No serious Greek scholars. No serious scholars at all support their views, actually. They have no... The, even the Mormons have serious scholars on their side, but Jehovah's Witnesses have literally uh, no serious scholars. And why I bring this up is because we are going to we are going to be dealing with Jehovah's Witness a lot in the future. I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but they have a, a you know a temple or whatever they call it over there. Uh, and and so as we witness in this area, and as we as we continue as we continue to reach out to the congregation, uh, I'm sorry, to the community, we are going to be running up against Jehovah's Witnesses. It's just something that's going to have to happen. Um, Right, and so, uh, um, okay, go to the next, I already said that, no Greek scholars ever supported their view. Go to the next uh, side there. Uh, Matt seven fifteen. let me turn there right quick. And I want to read this to you because this is very, very important. You know, you cannot believe everything that somebody says. You can't. Don't be naive here. Some people will come in and they'll start saying stuff. 
th- th- they'll say stuff about other people within the church. They'll say stuff about God. They'll say they'll say stuff, and they'll and they'll and they'll they'll pretend like they have authority to it, and they'll try to drag you into it. They'll try to they'll try to get they'll try to get you away. But but watch out for this. This is what it says in Ma- Ma- Matthew seven fifteen uh, through twenty. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now. Remember that. They come in sheep's clothing. You're going to think that they are good. You're going to think that they are a sheep. It's not, it's not going to be so obvious. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember Jonestown, uh, Jim Jones, many people thought that he was an, ups- an upright standing fellow. Uh, and obviously, they used isolation and intimidation later on. But at, the, at first, people really did think that he was a, a, uh, a genuine guy. And we all see how that went. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know what that is, uh, read a history book. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, ravenous wolves. These people seek to destroy the church. They seek to destroy you. Do not let yourselves have any part with these people. They are going to lead you astray. They're going to lie to you. And you're not even going to know that you're being lied to because they're going to be in sheep's clothing. Watch out for these people. Every word that is spoken from, spoken from, the, uh, from this pulpit, you need to, you need to look up in scripture and see if it's, if it's accurate or not. Even if I say it, even if pastor says it, don't take our word for it. Go study scripture. Spend time in prayer. Don't, 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 don't let yourself, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Uh, and that's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no. Um, so every he- uh, healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tra- tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Okay. So these are just some, 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 some facts about, Russell's, uh, about Russell as, as a person, okay? Uh, he claimed to go on a world tour. He highly publicized this. He even had advertisements published in papers across, across the world saying about all these great multitude that he's reached, uh, reached how everyone welcomed him with embracements and everything. Uh, a, a newspaper, uh, The Eagle, I think was their, their name, did, did, uh, did a follow-up uh, on it. There, w- there was no tour. As far as they can tell, he might have gone to some of the places, but there was no record of him ever having these events. He lied about it and did it as a publicity scheme so that he could get more people on his side. Okay? This was early 1900s. Uh, he, uh, this, another thing he used, he used subsi- subsidiary societies under a holding company where he was maintaining the majority of the profits. If you look at that number right there, 990 out of 1,000. Okay? He was holding majority stocks, and, and he said this, oh, no, I'm not in it for the money, I did, 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 did. But that's because he was lying, and the whole time he was using subsidiary societies under a holding company. So he was basically uh, uh, doing, uh, doing back doors to get all the money. He was still getting the money. It was all going to him. He paid, uh, he paid some other guys the other $10. Okay. Um, next, he sold mir- he so- uh, These are just a few of the things, by the way, the highlights, if you will. He sold what he, what he called miracle wheat, which was supposed to have grown better. You'd get a better increase and all this different stuff. It turned out it was just regular, you know, wheat. wasn't anything special to it. Um, next thing, uh, he had multiple false predictions of the end. He died, I believe, in 1916, and he claimed that the end was going to start in 1914. Long story short, um, it didn't happen, as we're still here, obviously. Um, and, and obviously the Jehovah's Witnesses have a long history of false predictions. Um, if you look at our, our, our Christian Bible, we, we have had no false predictions, not a single one. In fact, I was thinking about this morning in Isaiah, I think it's 45, it, uh, Isaiah is prophesying long before the Persians ever attack the, Pal- the Palestinian area, and he says that King Cyrus, he actually calls him out by name, Cyrus is going to, going to do this, and we, ha- we can date those texts to before Persia came into that area. We can easily date them from before that, and it clearly calls them out by name. And what happens? King Cyrus comes in and takes over Palestine. Wow, I didn't see that one coming. See what I mean? Uh, so, uh, Russell's character, uh, he lied under official court cross-examination. These are official records. You can go and read these official court uh, manuscripts. Y- you can go look them up yourself. Th- these are something that was on official uh, uh, cross-examination. He admitted in court, which is public record, that he was not familiar with Greek, yet he contradicted every major uh, uh, biblical doctrine. Is this someone that you want to entrust your life to? I- is this someone who, who you feel comfortable with? He, he did money schemes, he did frauds, he did all these different things, and, 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 and 
is this, does this sound like someone you want to actually entrust your eternal soul to? The assemblies of God, I, I understand we're not the only saved denomination. I, I get that. You know what I mean? But we have a structure called authority, okay? Jehovah's Witnesses don't have that now, and they never have. It has always been under one person who calls all the shots, okay? Um, so basically, uh, he said, okay, yes, I am familiar with, with Greek. And then they said, okay, can you, wh- what, is this, what is this Greek letter right here? And he said, I don't know. He said, can you translate this? No, I don't know. He did the exact same thing uh, with, uh, with a very simple Hebrew verse, which, by the way, that same Hebrew verse was taken to a Hebrew scholar, and he said, is this a, dif- is this a difficult Hebrew text? Is it, were they being unfair to Charles Russell? And he said, no, I would fail any first-year Hebrew student who could not uh, translate that verse. It is that simple. So it's not like they were asking him some really hard verse. Okay? And these are public records. Go to the next slide. Um, so it's an absolute autocracy. Basically what that means, uh, those are big words. I can't even pronounce that second one, autocracy or whatever, nonsense. Basically what it means is there's, there's one guy in charge of the whole deal. That's basically a dumbed-down version. Uh, so even, even the Bible is taught through the lens of the leader, Russell. And he actually wrote in his writings, you can, you can look this up yourself and read his writings, he claimed that y- even if you did not read the Bible, all that you really needed to have was illumi- for illumination was to read his translations. And which, which, by the way, only hinted towards, the scri- towards Scripture. They didn't even use his false, do- uh, false translation of the Scriptures. See what I mean here? So he, he, he's saying, okay, you have, to, you have to look at my view of Scriptures. And he even went as far as to say that everybody else lacked the illumination that he had in his, in his mind. See, you can't let people do this. This is what people, uh, this is what Jim Jones has done. This is what Russell did. This is what they will do. They'll try to claim some new revelation, like, uh, like the one that you had before wasn't good enough or something. You know, oh, well, Jesus did do that, but then he gave us the new revelation with the Mormon Bible. Yeah, okay, whatever. W- it, Hebrews makes it very clear that that's not going to happen. And then we also, we also see very clearly that Scripture was given uh, for, us, for us to study, okay? If somebody claims that you have to have their lens on to understand scripture they're lying to you they're lying to you they're playing you for a fool okay scripture is the only thing we need to understand scripture go to the next slide um uh, so why don't you witness the two um answers i hear the most are fear and i just don't know if they're going to ask me a hard question i hear that so often so we're going to talk about that in first corinthians so Paul, Paul stayed for a while, and he decides to go on a missionary tour. And one of the places that he goes to on his first missionary tour is a place called Corinth. Uh, this was uh, in the Roman Empire. And uh, this is what he says, writing to them after, after the church was established. He writes to them, and this is what he writes. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay, right there. What, is he, what did he just say? He didn't come with a bunch of wisdom to show how, how knowledgeable he was. He just came to, to say Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he didn't have to have all the, all the answers. When you witness, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't. Okay? If they ask you a hard question that you don't know, be honest. Tell them this. I don't know. <gasps> yeah, it's okay. You don't have to know everything. All you have to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse three, uh, verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. See, he wasn't even a good pu- uh, pu- public speaker. He wasn't even a good public speaker. He didn't, so he, he came w- without knowing a bunch of big words, without knowing a bunch of doctrine, all kinds of stuff. He came without a good, pu- uh, good presentation, yet he started a church. You don't have to be knowledgeable. And you, don't ha- and you don't have to not be fearful. Y- you, know, you know what one of the first things is you have to tell people going through uh, panic attacks and anxiety? Do it afraid. Do it afraid. You keep going. I don't think I can. It doesn't matter. Keep your head down. Keep going. <laughs> just keep plowing through. It, it's it's going to get a lot worse, and it's going to get a lot better. That's just how it goes. Um, so, uh, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Why? That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but what? But in the power of God. See, he did that so that people wouldn't look at him and say, Paul, you're this, you're that. He did it so that they would look at him and say, God is a powerful God. See, when we witness to people, we don't want them to think that we're the ones who have all the answers. We want them to know that we know the one who has all the answers. 
to see the difference there, the focus is not on us and witnessing. The focus is on God, who it has always been on. So uh, people often get a little bit lost in this. We don't want to argue our point, okay? So don't just sit there and argue with people. And you can tell argumentative people, you know, and pray for them. You know what I mean? It's, they're not a lost cause. Just pray for them. But also be ready. And I'm not going to turn to these, but I'm going to basically just tell you them, and they're there if you want to go to them. One of them, talk, I mean, Paul's writing, and he says, you know, hey, don't get caught up in these pointless debates and all these, you know, arguments. That they, just dis- they just attract and they take away. But, and then the other one, he, he says, um, be ready in and out of season. No matter what, be ready to, br- to give people the reason as to why. And you can look those up on your own if you want the PowerPoint. Let me know. I'll go to the next slide. So don't argue with people. Don't, don't just be argumentative. But be ready with an answer when they want one. Wh- why, why believe in God? Well, let me tell you what he's done in my life. Let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you how he's changed me. And that's something that people can relate to. Um, so when you're witnessing to Joe's witness, here are just some things to keep in mind. First, they will redefine your words. So it's very important to talk to them and establish what, what you're saying. When you say Jesus, you're going to say something like this. I believe that Jesus uh, uh, w- was, was God and that he, he came to die, die for our sins and that uh, by that sacrifice we are saved. And they're going to say, yeah, we believe that too. And the reason why they believe that is because in all cult systems, they redefine words to mean something according to their bias, according to their, um, to their views, Okay. And so they're going to redefine stuff. When you say Jesus, they're going to, it's going to go through their Jehovah's Witness filter in their brain, and they're going to say, the created God, right? Okay, got it. He died. He did that. See what I mean? And they're going to say, yes, all things were created through him. Except, you know, they'll, they'll leave out the fact that they think that he was created. See what I mean? So, so when you're witnessing to them, clarify what you mean and ask them to clarify what they mean. Okay? Remember, stay on focus with this because cult people are literally brainwashed. Okay? To, to, to look through Russell's eyes or to look through uh, Joseph Smith's eyes or to look through, um, you know, see what I mean? They're, they're trained to, to look through these lenses rather than, rather than just looking to Scripture and seeing what does Scripture say, okay? Um, <clears throat> so another thing that they'll say is they'll say, oh, well, uh, uh, John 3.16 says that Jesus is God's only begotten Son, which means that he was created. And for that, it's just, an, once again, another misunderstanding. In Hebrews eleven seventeen, it mentions, that it uses the exact same word for Abraham's second son, um, who he uh, went to offer up on the, mount, on the mountain. It says uh, Abraham went with his only begotten son, but he already had another son. So it couldn't have possibly mean his only created son, could it? Uh, the, what the word actually means is unique. That's all that the only begotten means. Why, why the confusion? Let me, let me explain. In the King James Version, when they translated in 1611, I want to say, um, there were some things that, that were a little bit hard for them to translate and carry over from the Latin and from the Greek and whatnot. So the, some of the things they just kind of left ambiguous. And this was one of the things that they kind of just left ambiguous. Um, so anyways, um, and uh, you have, uh, eventually in your conversation with them, they're going to say something line, along the lines of this. Well, that's fine, and that, me- that means that to you, but that's not how I see it. And this is, you have to bring this up, okay? If language means anything, things are what they are by definition. In other words, you cannot redefine something to mean something else if language means anything, okay? This is a pulpit. If I say you, I put my Bible on the pulpit, and you translate pu- pulpit to be dog, okay? You're not using common English, Okay? If language means anything, it has to mean what it means by definition. You have to stick with some kind of set standard. Luckily, we have that set standard. It's called English. Unless you're teaching, talking to somebody in Spanish, Taviana. Um, drive a wedge. Oh, th- this is very important. Drive a wedge between the individual and the belief system. Okay? You want them to know that you're not attacking them. Okay? Stay away from that. Help them to see that there's a difference between them as a person and the Jehovah's Witness as a cult. If you can help them to see that, and you're going to have to be sly about this, because once again, they've been brainwashed. Okay, they're going to be on their game. There's probably going to be at least two of them there. They're, they're not going to be by themselves, because once again, cults thrive on isolation. Anytime you're isolated from a group, it's always something to do with the cult. Oh, I don't go to church because I don't really need it. I just have a Bible study in my, in my home. Cult. See the difference there? Uh, biblically, scripturally, it says that we need to meet his body. So obviously, wh- someone who says that they're not meeting in a church, they're just not listening to the Bible, which means that they are part of a cult. Um, 
Okay, so, uh, and you want to appear as not attacking. You want to appear as, you know, you don't want to, oh, you're Jehovah's Witness? I ain't got time for you. And slam the door in their face. Or what my brother used to do, get a hose and spray them down. You don't want to do those things, okay? You don't want to be attacking. You want to be a neutral person and help them to see that you actually do care for them. And if you don't actually do care for them, then you're the one who's at fault, okay? They're out there trying, try, doing their best because they feel like that's what they're supposed to be doing, going door to door and whatnot. And you're sitting in your house and, and you act all angry to them? I'm sorry, who's, who's wrong here? I thought you were the one who were supposed to have the, know the God of love. See what I mean? Don't respond and, 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 and attack. And go to the next slide, buddy. Um, be led by the Spirit only. Don't rampage, okay? This is where uh, some Christians go to the extreme. Oh, Jehovah's Witness, I got to track them down. You know, like, like somehow they're an enemy that they're shooting with a, like aiming a sight at them. It's like, calm down there, okay? Same thing, when you're talking to them, you're going to want to only say what the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, okay? You are not trying to win an argument. Remember that. Because Jehovah's Witness will draw you, it's almost unintentional, but they will draw you into, this, into these debates. They'll just pull you on in. Slow down and remember, you are not on a rampage here, okay? You're not trying to take out as many Jehovah's Witnesses as you can, all right? Keep your eyes on the goal. We're trying to witness to people. Okay. Uh, pray for the Holy Spirit to go ahead of you and illuminate their minds. This is key. Don't even try to witness to somebody if you're not spending time in prayer. Don't even try. It's not going to happen, okay? The Holy Spirit calls to mind as we're witnessing to people, but he can't call to mind something that's not there. If you're not studying, if you're not in the, in the Word studying, if you're not praying to the Lord, you're going to be drawing a big blank, and you're going to do it with the wrong attitude, too. So you're going to be sitting there uh, arguing with somebody, maybe even unintentionally, and saying, and say, you know, you need to love Jesus, you know, and, and the whole time, and all that they're hearing is, is, wow, this guy is such a hypocrite, okay? Remember, we're supposed to have something different, okay? Um, I already mentioned this, cults thrive on isolation, do what you do in haste, okay? Chances are, if you actually start to get through to one of them, the other one will have, the, have his partner switched out the next time they come. Uh, I've had this done many times. Jory and I were trying to do some stuff with Mormons, and um, they came, you know, the, the w second time, the, the one guy seemed like he actually started to understand what we were saying. Third time he came, that guy wasn't there all of a sudden. Mm, I wonder where he went. Cults thrive on isolation. If you're going to say something, do it quick. They probably won't, they probably won't send the same person twice. Um, mm, uh, also, let them know, you know, hey, I, I'm open. If you, guys, if you have any further questions, you know, I, I'm open. You can come by. You know, just let them know. Um, they will be surprised that you care, but don't share the belief. Because in Jehovah's Witness, they're, they're taught, they're pounded into their head that everybody else is liars and, and, and they're all, they all hate you and everything. But uh, in Jehovah's Witness, that's the only place you're really going to find belonging, and that's the only place that real, real nice people uh, are. So if you are genuine with them, if you are actually nice to them, and you actually do love and care for them, th it's going to cause them to doubt their belief system. Because they're going to see, wait, this person actually does care for me, yet they're not Jehovah's Witness. See what I'm saying? And that's one of the w ways that you can drive a wedge in between them and their beliefs, by establishing Christ's love. That's the same way, you know what? That's the same way we were told to witness by Jesus, and it's the same way we should witness now. It's not; it hasn't changed. Um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to hate everything. Honestly, I kid you not. If you read their literature, I'm not even kidding. They are they are they are called the the religion of hate by many. Actually, it's it's kind of funny. But uh, seriously, they they are taught to hate everyone. And f uh, us, uh, the Christian Church, they're told to hate us because the social work that we do, it, we don't actually mean it. We actually do it because we're trying to ensnare people, or s I f forget it, something like that. So basically, our food pantry, we do that because we hate the community, not because we love them. <laughs> uh, uh, social work. Anybody who those. Do gooders? Oh no, they're they're evil too. Uh, the government? Oh, you, uh, Jehovah's Witness won't even go in, won't even uh, serve a, a government if they're called to time of war. They won't fight. Um, they they do not they do not support their government. There's no uh, patriotism or anything. Uh, they are they they believe in their own little thing that's kind of just separated from the rest of the world. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, when you guys are when you guys are are, are are witnessing Jehovah's Witness, be on your toes, okay? These guys are trained for years and years and years as to how to manipulate your words. Okay, you, you, you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna just be able to say five words and get them saved. You're gonna need to be on your toes and be really sharp. Be on your guard. Okay, 
Um, so, okay, they, they will take scripture out of context, so whenever they bring up scripture, make sure you know the context of the scripture. This is where knowing the word comes greatly. Stay in the word, stay in the word, stay in the word. You got to know the, know the truth to know the false, okay? You have to do that. It's not going to come any other way. Um, they're, pre- uh, they're going to p- be preoccupied with Armageddon, the end of the age, Jehovah's being the only created God, and hating. Those are the things that they're really going to be focused in. So be on to this and, and, and start, start thinking of different ways that you can, you can, you can lead around to, to, to an actual beneficial conversation. Um, learn what they believe and learn what you believe. Know the distinction. You know, you can't witness somebody oftentimes when you don't know what they... Well, Paul goes to, I forget where it is, but he, he looks around and he starts to fill out the, the, fill out the city. He says, okay, you worship all these gods, but there's this one here marked for the unknown god. Let me tell you, this is the one that you actually need to know. And he uses that as a vantage point to share the gospel, share the gospel with them, okay? See, see how he did that? He used something that was familiar with them. Get familiar with them, okay? Know how they work so that you will not be fooled and so that you can share the gospel with them. Um, the Bible has to be your basis. Everything you say has to be based on Scripture, and you have to have something to back it up to. Okay, you can't just say, oh, it's in the Bible. I actually know what you're talking about. Um, do it in love. If you, are, if you, if you tr- even try to witness to Joe's witness without love, just don't, don't even say anything. Just go ahead and close your mouth and shut the door. It's better that way, okay? Because they are told that we hate them, and by, sa- by, by saying something a- a- out of a- anger instead of out of love, you're just proving them right, Okay? So if you say something, do it in love or don't do it at all. Um, don't lie if you are unsure. If they ask a question that you don't know about, don't lie to them. So many times in the church we feel like we have to know every answer all the time. Oh, well, that's because of this. Well, maybe not. See what I mean? If you don't know, just say, I don't know. I can research that and get back with you. Um, live to show Christ to others. The greatest testimony that we have is our life, Okay. If we claim Jesus one day and then the very next day we're out, you know, uh, getting drunk and yelling at people and beating our kids, well, that's not going to show much of love, is it? We got to live different, okay? We got to live different if they want to see anything different. Let me go to the next slide. We're almost done, guys. Uh, pray through. This is something that I would very, very greatly like to see reestablished in the church today. Pray through. That means this when you're going through a struggle, when you're up against a brick wall, you pray. When you're done praying, and you're starting to get up, sit back down and pray again. Okay? A uh, very wise man who I forgot his name. Yeah. I memorize a lot of stuff. Like, okay, I have no idea how many books are in the Bible. I have no idea what order they are in. But I know what's in the books. See what I mean? I can't memorize the, those external things because in my mind they don't come across as, as, they seem pointless. So I don't memorize them. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter to me whether there's 50 books or 70 books. I don't care. All that I care about is what's in those books. And... Um, I forgot my, what my point was. Was there? Oh, yeah, the wife can't remember that guy's name. Uh, and he said this you need to pray for at least one hour just to maintain your spiritual walk. You need to pray for two hours a day to have any kind of a headway. Two hours a day. W- what, what do we do even in the services? Have you paid attention to how you pray in the service? You, you, you come up here for about, you know, I'm not saying anything judgmental, and please don't read into this. You come and you sit for about two minutes and you get up and leave, you know what I mean? That's great, you know, I, God bless you for praying or whatever, but I mean, you need to establish a, a routine in your life of prayer. You need to have a lifestyle of prayer, okay? Um, you, you, need to, you need to stop whatever you're doing every day and say, I need to go and be alone with the Lord. I need this. Okay, we don't, uh, prayer is not a good thing to do. It's something that we need. If we don't pray... A, a, a Christian without prayer in his life is like an animal with no water to drink. Good luck. You're going to die. See what I mean? Prayer is foundational to our growth. It's foundational. We can't choose when and when, and when not to pray. We have to pray. Stay in prayer. Next, study the Word. These two things alone keep people out of drugs. When you're done with drug addicts, these two things alone will keep them out of drugs. Keep them in prayer. Keep them in the Word. Those two things by themselves. The ones who give up doing these two things are the ones who aren't going to make it. Okay? Um, study the word. If you don't know it in, inside and out, you're not going to be able to witness to people. You're not going to know what's in there. Um, meet as often as the doors are open. The, uh, one of the signs of a Christian is that they meet together. We meet together to, to work out false doctrines. We work together to, to be disciplined, to be encouraged, to be comforted. To, to, see, this is why we do these things. Okay, fellowship is actually commanded by the Lord. 
Um, once and once again, why we uh, why we can know uh, about um, people who say, "Oh, I don't go to church anymore." Well, um, so meet as often as the doors are open. Seek after God. What is involved with seeking after God? Prayer, fasting, worship. You know, during worship time, actually seek after the Lord. You know, these are things. These are things that will cause growth. Um, step out of the boat. You know, we, we, in, in the Gospels, it tells the story of, of Jesus has his disciple, and his name is Peter. He steps out of the boat, and he ends up sinking. Uh, and he was walking on water for a little bit, but then he, he got his eyes on the waves, and he starts, he starts sinking. And, and Jesus reaches up, and he pulls him back up, and he says, you know, why did you start to doubt? You know, Peter failed, but, but he tried. Step out of the boat. You're going to fail. Newsflash, you're going to fail. It's okay. But... Jesus will be there to lift you up out of the waves. You just step out of the boat and, and, and keep seeking after him. When you fail, he'll lift you up. You just keep going. And then the last thing I want to I point out, this, was, this has been on my mind all week. I just read this, and then Pastor talked about it this morning. I was like, well, I'm putting that in. Um, so I actually rewrote this in. Um, King Saul wasn't destined to fail. You know, I, Pastor's talking about the story this morning. The first king of Israel, his name was Saul. And God chose him, and he, and he came. But then he started, he did his own thing. He built himself a little statue over here. He didn't follow God's, God's words. And so it makes you think, why did God ever even pick him? And the reason is this. He wasn't destined to fail. God gave him the chance. He gave him the choice. And God gives each, as a, each of us that same chance and that same choice. Okay? Y- you are not destined to fail in the future. You probably will eventually fail in the future. But <laughs> the difference being, God's giving you that choice as to whether to seek him or not. I think that's the last slide, right, buddy? Um, and so how we're, going to, how we're going to close is we're going real simple here, guys. Um, with this morning, witnessing was one of the key focuses of that message that I think Serena gave. I'm not sure. Uh, and, and it really seems like God's been saying this a lot in his words. You know, the hour is near. We've got to be witnessing to people. We're losing time. And, you know, God said the same thing back with Jesus in Jesus' day. How much shorter do we have now? You know, um, I, I, like to th- I like to think of it because it m- motivates me. Um, think of the world on, us on uh, being held to God by a single rope, and all the strands of the rope have broken free except for this one last strand. I like to think of it like that because it motivates me to do something about it. You know, if I'm comfortable, I'm not going to do anything. But if I'm... Uh, my focus is on other people. I am going to do something. So what we're going to do is uh, if you would just like to be used by God um, as a witness more, you would like to witness to people more, you would like to be a witness more, you would like to live a witness. T- it doesn't have to be family. It can be anybody. You, you want to be a witness to, witness to family. You want to be a witness to, to Jehovah's Witness. Uh, you want to be a, a witness to Mormons, whatever it is. Um, if you would like to be a witness, uh, just uh, if you would come to the front.